Hello students, you have gone through almost half of the chapter of learning that is chapter 6 of class 11 psychology. Today we come to part 5 of this chapter. Here we shall study concept learning and skill learning. These are the two kinds of learning that are used by us to gain knowledge, acquaint ourselves and perform tasks in our daily lives. So you would find them very interesting like I presume you would be finding the rest of the chapter. Let us come to concept learning. What is it? On your screens is the definition. Concept learning involves the process to organize objects, events or organisms into categories so that within the category these objects, events or organisms are treated as equivalent even though they are different in their features. Well, there are so many things around us. How do we gain understanding of them? We usually place them in certain groups based upon our observations of what have been taught to us in schools or by our parents. So this is where we develop concepts. We say all these things which have a feature of being eaten, they can be hard raw, they can be peeled, they can be of different colors though, but all of them together are fruit. So, their features might be different, but there are certain features which are still same by which we can establish them into one category. Similarly, all these kinds of things that we see around are animals. Now they can be four-legged, they can be cats, dogs, cows, they can even be two-legged and moving like can kangaroos or penguins, but we know these are birds, these are animals, these are fruit, all these are cars. So there are some features which are common to them and some features which are still different with respect to each of them even though they are placed in a particular category. So this is how we learn through concepts. Concept is a category used to refer to a number of objects for example animals, fruit, building, crowd. These are set of features or attributes that are connected by some rule. Here as you see there are different blocks. All of them are blocks now. There is one color, blue, yellow, orange. There are different shapes, circle, triangles, rectangles, but they are all blocks. So, some concepts that we have used in this picture are blocks, colors, shapes, even size can be used. Other things can be smoothness, roughness, softness, hardness, the material with which they are made. So, these are the categories by which we place them. Now, what are the features of a concept learning or features of a particular concept? Any characteristic or object that is observed in them and can be considered equivalent to some in the group. However, it is discriminated by other objects in other groups or even from the same objects in the same group. The properties can be color, size, number, shape, roughness, hardness as we just saw. Now there are different types of rules. These can be simple rules, complex rules that lead to making of concepts. How does a concept form in our mind would depend upon whether you have categorized them on basis of simple things or they are very very complex. For example, a car, it can be categorized on the basis of the length it has, the size it has, the number of seats it has and the complex concepts can be the type of engine what is the basic uh, running speed? A computer can be categorized as a desktop, a laptop, a palm top and they can be more specific and complex features like its RAM, its memory, its running speed, its screen type and these days even many more things like jelly bean, TFT, LED. So, based upon these rules you can have types of concepts which are artificial and natural. Now what are these artificial and natural concepts? Let us see. Artificial concepts are well defined. The rules are very very precise and rigid. They are simply necessary and jointly sufficient rules. For example, a square. There are four kinds of attributes that you can relate to in a square. It is a closed shape. It has four sides. 
it has equal sides and it has equal angles. So, these four attributes make a square. So, these are jointly sufficient and individually each of them is necessary to make a square a square. These will not be categorized when we are defining a triangle. The same attributes will not apply when we are talking about a circle. So, again I repeat simply necessary and jointly sufficient rules are related to artificial concepts and they are very very specific. On the contrary for natural concepts the rules are not very rigid, they are not very clearly defined. For instance biological objects, real world products, human artifacts like clothes, like way of dressing, like architecture, a house, a building. So, building is a building though all of them are not defined by same categories like a geometrical figure where we saw square. A building might have 4 rooms, it might even have 10 rooms, it might have 2 stories or 4 stories. A building might be an educational institution building, for example, your school building, even your home is a building. So, these are natural concepts where the rules are not very rigid, but still there are some categories which make them belong to one particular group. This is the thing of concept learning. Now, certain rules are conjunctive rules, they are based on conjunctive concepts which emerge out of relevant features. Relevant features are set of features that are connected by specific rules and irrelevant features are the features that do not follow rules. Connected by all these rules, they are conjunctive concepts. For example, the concept of a square is a conjunctive concept and they follow what is known as conjunctive rules. You would be saying what was so unique about it? Well, how concepts are learned, what part of brain or memory operates and makes us acquire them is something that you would learn in your next chapter which is thinking. In the chapter on memory again you will be dealing about how concepts are formed in our brain. Here is a basic basic picture to give you which parts of brain usually operate. You would have seen this in the chapters on sensation and perception as well. Let us come to the next type of learning which is skill learning. We learn so many things around us, we acquire so many skills in our life. The first skill maybe we acquired was to talk to walk, to write, to read, to drive a bike, to drive a car and you are in school acquiring new skills each day. Sometimes you learn to speak on the stage and other times you learn to play an instrument, a musical instrument like a banjo or a guitar. You also acquire skills of gymnastics, you acquire skills while playing games. So, what is so unique about skill learning? We all do it, but how do we do it? What are the phases? What are the processes? Let us talk about them. Before that, let us go through the basic definition of skill. Skill is the ability to perform some complex task efficiently and smoothly. For instance, driving a car, flying an airplane, shorthand writing. It is learned by practice and exercise. Skill consists of a sequence of stimulus response associations. That is, a chain of perceptual motor responses involves developing of a skill. You perceive a thing, you take it to your mind and then you apply it while performing a motor task. So, that means skill gaining or skill acquisition goes through certain phases, right? The process of skill development involves qualitatively different phases. Performance becomes more and more spontaneous with each successive attempt or with each successive practice session. The performance improves, then a performance plateau comes and then it starts improving again. Do not you all notice this in your real life as well? For instance, when you are sitting to write an exam, at the first 5 minutes you probably have an uncomfortable position, your fingers are not writing very very quickly, the way you are sitting is not very conducive. But as the time passes, your speed becomes more, you sit in a position which is more comfortable and you are able to complete your exam. This continues for some time, usually for 3 hours. But imagine 
if you were asked to write an exam for say 10 hours, would the same extent of gaining continue? No, you would be so tired after say 3 or 4 hours that you would not be able to write further or your handwriting will become very bad, your speed will slow down. This establishes the process of skill development my friends. As we said in the first phase the skill gets acquired, then it gets slowly improved with practice sessions. Then a plateau comes where no more improvement can be held. After break if you take another practice session then the improvement goes on further. This involves fatigue, fatigue in terms of physical effort as well as in terms of mental and cognitive efforts. So now you understand that skill development goes through a process. Let us look more precisely at phases of skill development. These have been given by the psychologist Fitz. He talks of three phases particularly cognitive, associative and automotive. Each of these phases involves a different kind of mental action or a mental process that a human being goes through. Let us discuss them in detail. The cognitive phase. In this phase you understand and memorize instructions. You also have to understand the task. You have to be alive in consciousness as to the outside cues, the instructional demands and also the outcomes of your response. For example, if you are learning to drive a car, first you would go through the instructions that the instructor has given you. He would tell you where the brake is, where the clutch is, how do you hold the steering. So these are cognitive phases of skill development where only the mental process is involved. You are not using your hands, you are not also speaking that is the verbal responses are not involved. In the cognitive phase, the instructions are taken in, they are understood and they are also memorized. So this is something only related to the thinking part. The second is the phase of cognitive development in skill learning. Here different sensory inputs are linked with appropriate responses. The learner or the subject is supposed to be very very attentive. Concentration has to be at its peak. Different practice sessions are given. And as practice sessions increase, performance improves, time required to perform decreases, errors also decrease and the practice continues. Thus, in this phase you are applying the instructions given to you in the cognitive phase and associating them with the motor learning processes. The third phase of cognitive learning is automotive learning. This is the phase where subsequent practice sessions lead to acquiring of a skill to such an extent that conscious effort decreases to the minimal, where automatically people are able to do the things that they were learning during the first two phases. Specific features of the automatic phase are attentional demand decreases, the interference created by external factor reduces, skilled performance gets attained with minimal demands on your conscious efforts. Now let us take an example. When you were learning to ride a bicycle, you have learned that as yet, right? You are in class 11. Well, when you were learning to ride a bicycle, for the first time you were very very conscious. Somebody would be holding you from the back and you would be asking constantly, should I pedal? Should I stop? Are you there? You would be very very confused and very very scared. You learnt it, instructions were given to you, go straight, okay be slow, well I am there behind you. These were cognitive phases of learning where you were following the instructions. Then in the associative phase you were making those instructions go real. Somebody told you that these are pedals and you have to move them. In this phase you associated the pedal with the picture of a pedal, you saw it in real and started pedaling and started moving ahead. Then as you practice it more and more came the phase of automotive development of skin where now you are able to cycle to your school or to the nearby shop. While talking to your friends, you hardly pay attention to whether somebody is behind you holding you. Nobody has to give you instructions, go straight, your cycle is moving in this direction or in that direction. Here now you have stopped associating yourself with the external stimuli that might create disturbance. Now you are able to do it very very easily. Similarly, go to the phase in class nursery where you were learning to write. Your parents had to instruct you well for a not a straight line, a slanted line. You would learn to draw your A with so much of concentration. Somebody would give you instructions, you would apply them 
and you would be really distracted if somebody was talking near you would say oh be quiet i'm trying to write an a or i'm trying to memorize my tables by gradual practice and subsequent sessions now has come a stage in your life well where you are able to write not only a but complete sentences while talking to your friends somebody might be creating noise around you but that does not create interference with your writing letters or with your making simple calculations like subtraction or addition so practice makes the man perfect so much have you practiced going through your tables going through your alphabets going through the phase of riding a bicycle that now you are perfect at it now you do not need distractions to make you go wrong now you are not consciously doing them now you have reached the phase of automotive skill development friends in this part part 5 of chapter 6 learning today you came to know about concept learning and skill learning how our mental processes work to make us acquire new understanding of our environments and what phases we go through to get new talents built on in ourselves we also learned about the importance of practice and various categories that we use to classify objects persons events around us in the next part we shall deal with transfer of learning and key processes involved in learning i hope you are able to see the practical implications of all these concepts and enjoy them thank you Thank you.